Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Fred Adams. I'm one of the founding members of HSA for America, and I'm here tonight to discuss with everybody five key facts that we all should know about Obamacare or the Affordable Health Act uh, before 2014 actually arrives. And I know we have more people registered to attend this evening's webinar than we have had in several months. So I'm not sure if everybody's here tonight with just some general questions, or maybe if you're looking for help, or maybe you've tried to go on to one of the exchanges and shop for yourself and experienced a lot of frustration, crashes, and lack of information. But no matter what caused you to join me this evening, I'm going to be here to hopefully address all of your questions. I do have all the phone lines muted presently, so we don't have any background noise or interference from somebody that may be on a cell phone. It'll probably take me about 30 minutes to run through these five key points that I have to make, and then I'm going to unmute the line and take questions for as long as we have them. So I will be yours as long as you need me once I'm done presenting. If you do have any questions that come up throughout the course of my presentation, you can feel free to go ahead and type them out in the chat dialog box um, in the little start meeting application. And I will start by taking questions there first. And from there, then I'll open up the phone lines for anybody that wants to ask over the phone. So let's go ahead and kick things off. The first thing that I say everybody needs to know about Obamacare is we all need to understand what is about to happen or actually what's already happening now. And as you see here from the slide on my screen, if you're somebody that's in one of the 36 states that is using, that is using the federal marketplace um, instead of creating their own state-based exchange, if you've gone and tried to shop for a new health policy to see if you qualify for tax credits or to just get a general feel for what premiums may be for you next year, you've probably seen this screen. This is one of about a half dozen different error messages that this site has been giving people, but literally no one in this country has been able to apply for health insurance on the federal exchange and we're now 15 days into open enrollment. And I should say that there is no doubt that this program was intended to be a great thing. It was intended to help lots of people by offering affordable, easy to understand health insurance coverage. And so far, it's wind up turning into a situation that many computer professionals are calling the biggest, worst IT programming nightmare of all time. And that may or may not turn out to be true by the time things are all said and done, but a few things we do know is this nation has spent over $600 million. We've had over three and a half years since this law was placed, and we still don't have the technology in place to allow most Americans to even view what their options are, let alone to actually apply for health insurance. Now, if you're like some people that I've talked to, you may have heard the story a couple of weeks ago about the 21-year-old college student in Georgia who was said to be one of the first people to actually enroll on the federal exchange after spending over six hours trying to log in on October 1st. And he was hailed by some media outlets as a national hero. And it actually turned out that that individual had not applied for health insurance policy at all. He had, in fact, gotten through the first step of the process, which was simply completing his application for any tax credits or subsidy that he may be available for. And if everybody would give me just one moment, I'm just getting a message. I might be experiencing some technical difficulty. So one second, please. Oh, 
Okay, I, I apologize about that. If anybody wasn't able to hear up until this point, I hear from my assistant that my vocals just started coming through. My apology. I'm going to jump back and kind of restart from scratch. Um, the first thing that we all need to know as we move forward into 2014 is we need to understand what's about to happen with health insurance in this country. And if you live in one of the 36 states that decided to use the federal marketplace or the federal exchange instead of creating their own state-based exchange, this page that you see on, on my monitor right now probably looks pretty familiar to you because if you've tried to log in and create an account, you may have seen this error message. It's one of about a half dozen different errors that I've seen trying to go in and help my customers over the course of the last 15 days. So despite the fact that we're having a lot of technical difficulties, I will say that the Affordable Health Care Act, or Obamacare, whichever you prefer to call it, it was intended to be a great program. It was set to help lots of people by offering affordable coverage that was going to be easy to understand, and it's actually turned into something that a lot of computer programmers are calling the biggest programming nightmare of all time. And by the time things are said and done, that may or may not turn out to be true. But a few things that we do know is this great nation of ours has spent over $600 million in creating this website. We've had over three and a half years since the law was passed. And on October 15th, 15 days into open enrollment, not one individual in this country has been able to submit a health insurance application through the federal exchange. <clears throat> Now, that may come as a surprise to some people because we heard a lot of news stories, especially the first few days of open enrollment. There was a 21-year-old college student in Georgia who was hailed to be a national hero because he was one of the first people to submit an application on the exchange after it took him six hours to log in and create an account and then submit his information. But it actually turned out that he never even tried to select a health insurance policy. What was originally set up to be a very simple, seamless process has actually turned into a three-step process, and you can't even see quotes for health insurance on the federal marketplace until you've created an account and you've applied for a subsidy. So uh, whether you want to get government assistance to pay for your insurance premium or not, you can't get through on this website to see what your options may be. Now, as recently as March, Henry Chow, who's the director of the IT services department that's responsible for creating this website, he indicated in a meeting that I was at that it was going to take no longer than 40 seconds for this website to verify your identity, verify how much of a subsidy that you were eligible for, which I always found that kind of mysterious because the subsidy that you will ultimately receive next year is going to be based on your 2014 income. And I don't know about anybody on this phone this evening, but I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know to the dollar what I'm going to make next year. But I do know in a few minutes later on in this presentation, I'm going to show each and every one of you how as little as $1 can make thousands of dollars of difference in what you wind up paying for your health insurance over the course of the next year. So what was supposed to be a 40-second process not only is not working in 40 seconds, it's still not working at all. And it is leaving us in a situation where there's a lot of uh, individuals out there that are, have a much higher level of computer expertise when it comes to programming than I do that are indicating, based on everything they see, if every single computer programmer on the government payroll spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, between now and the end of the year, that this system may not be ready to accept insurance applications before January 1. 
And I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm hoping and praying by the 1st of November we're able to submit applications through this marketplace. But I do know, despite any news reports that may say something to the contrary, insurance companies are reporting that they are not yet connected to the federal exchange. And if an insurance company isn't connected to the exchange, their rates wouldn't be showing, and you certainly couldn't submit an application for coverage. So applying for health insurance coverage, which used to be as simple as filling out one application and answering some basic personal information and some health questions, it's now become what can be a cumbersome three-step process. You have to start out by selecting the agent that you want to work with and give them authorization to represent you with the marketplace. Then you have to fill out a 12-page application to ask for any tax credit or subsidy that you may be eligible for. And then you have to submit an application for health insurance. And again, if you're in one of the 36 states using the federal exchange, you cannot get to step three right now because those dots have not yet been connected. Now, fortunately, in the 15 states that have their own state-based exchange, a handful of them actually are seeing people that are applying. Um, a lot of the state-based exchanges are experiencing similar problems. I saw a newspaper report today from Colorado that said in the first week they had 226 applications go through. Well, in a normal week of doing uh, insurance sales in the state of Colorado, there's probably 50 times that many applications that are usually submitted. So we're at a point in time where everybody's supposed to be able to apply for affordable coverage, and it's supposed to be easier than ever. And it's by far the most challenging thing that I've seen in my two and a half decades in this business. So with all that said, there are some great things about reform. So let's talk about how reform may affect you. First thing we need to know is we're currently in the middle of an open enrollment period. Even if the marketplace isn't really functional, we have from October 1 until March 31st of next year, to apply for health insurance. It is important to note that you have to apply for coverage by December 15th of this year for your policy to start by January 1. And if there's a chance that the system won't allow applications to go through by then, that could be a problem. And what it is actually looking like it may lead to is millions of Americans having to revert to submitting paper applications for something that we've spent over $600 million to design a website to do. But some great news, everybody in this wonderful nation is gonna be guaranteed to be able to get health insurance. You can no longer be turned down based on any prior health problems that you may have. So for anybody that's been declined for coverage in the past, this is one of the biggest improvements that you could have possibly asked for in our healthcare system. Premiums and the coverage that you actually receive, it's gonna vary based not on your health or how much risk you are to the insurance company, but it's gonna vary based on how much money you make. And the reason I say that is there will be subsidies or tax credits, whichever of the two words you prefer to use, they really mean one and the same, available for millions of Americans. And as a result, the cost for many people in this country to purchase health insurance that they pay out of their pocket, it's actually going to drop, especially if you're between the ages of 55 and 64 and you're not yet on Medicare, or if you're somebody that was unhealthy and you weren't able to get coverage in the past, or maybe you were charged a higher rate because of your pre-existing conditions. At the same time, there's gonna be a lot of people in this country that wind up paying a lot more for their coverage, especially anybody that is younger and healthy and maybe was able to get the absolute best rate possible. So with all that said, I think it's important that we all figure out how can we determine what's gonna be best for our individual situations. 
So as I've been talking to clients over the last few weeks, the last few months, you know, there's a few different options that we all have. Some people can keep their current plan in theory at least. <laughs> and the reason that I say that is if you have a policy that was in place before this law was passed on March 23rd, 2010, your policy is deemed to be grandfathered. And we all heard our president when he was talking about creating this law say, if you like what you have, you can keep it. However, that's proving to not necessarily be true. And the reason I say that is there are some states that are forcing insurance companies to terminate all current policies as of December 31st at the end of this year, saying that those policies are not reform compliant. As a matter of fact, just last week, we had several clients in the states of Missouri and Virginia who started receiving letters from their insurance company telling them just that. We're sorry that you have a grandfathered plan and you thought you could keep it. Your policy's terminating December 31st. We would be happy to sell you a policy on or off the exchange. Too bad, it's probably gonna cost more. Uh, if you have a policy that's not grandfathered, so you've purchased it since March 23rd of 2010, depending on the state that you live in, you may wanna consider changing coverage before the end of this year. Or you may wanna stick with the plan that you have. Some companies are allowing you to renew your effective date late in December. And the reason for doing that is you're, you would not be forced to purchase a reform compliant policy until the anniversary date of your policy next year. In which case, at that point in time, your non-grandfathered plan must terminate. So if you're with a company that is not allowing you to reset your effective date or your anniversary date in December, you might want to look at purchasing a new plan now with a company that would allow you to keep that policy through the, the duration of next year. You may find, especially if you're not eligible for a, any premium credits or subsidy, that you could save thousands of dollars next year by locking in a rate for 2013 because in most cases premiums are going up next year even if the individual consumer isn't paying more because they're getting tax credits from the government the cost of health insurance in just about every single state for every single age demographic is definitely increasing now if you're somebody that doesn't have coverage or if you're earning an income that's at less than 400% of the federal poverty level, certainly if you don't have coverage because you've been turned down in the past, your day is finally here. You are guaranteed health insurance. You can apply for coverage. If you're in a state that the state marketplace is working, you could apply for coverage today. If you're in a state that your exchange is not working, or maybe a state that's using the federal exchange, we would certainly be happy to get you started with the process by completing step one, naming us as your agent, completing step two, applying for any possible subsidies that you may receive. And what our agency is doing in that particular situation is once the insurance company connects with the exchange, we'll be contacting all of our clients that are two thirds of the way through the process and helping them quickly and easily finish the health application at that time. So whether you're uncovered now because of health issues or you're, you're in a situation where your premiums can go down next year that you pay out of your pocket because you're gonna get a subsidy, now I would say go ahead and take action now because you only have till December 15th to apply and your coverage start the 1st of January. And if you don't have coverage or if you can lower your premium, you want that as soon as possible. And I can promise everybody those first two weeks of December, between the 1st and the 15th, as everybody knows the clock's ticking and their time's running out, it's going to be crazy busy. And whether the marketplace is working by then or not, it's going to be much harder to get applications through or to maybe even reach an agent or 
to get somebody on the phone and talk to one of the navigators. So go ahead and take action now. Get your process as far along as possible so your coverage could start at the first of next year. And I would also say to everybody, you should at least consider getting a policy that is HSA qualified. And that actually leads me to my next slide where I want to talk for a few minutes about just what an amazing difference one dollar can make in your income. Now, I will say, before, before I start showing some uh, examples here, that any money that you put into a health savings account, it lowers your taxable income. So it could make or break whether or not you qualify to get any sort of premium subsidy. And I'll actually tell a story real quick. I, over the course of the last two weeks, I've talked to dozens and dozens of clients, and I'm finding some people that were very anti-reform that once they look at premiums and they realize that they're going to get a subsidy, they wind up being happy because they're seeing that the law is actually going to lower their cost some. And then I've talked to some people that were very for reform who see that their premiums are going up two to 300 percent, and suddenly they're not quite as happy about how this law works. But one couple that comes to mind particularly, and I'm going to leave my slide presentation now, and I'm going to go to this calculator that will allow me to help uh, show you what a difference a dollar can make in your income when it comes to calculating your subsidy or tax credit. So this couple I was talking to lived in Colorado, and they lived in the Denver area. I believe it was 80212 in the county of Denver. And they indicated to me they were going to make $66,000, is what they expect, expected to make next year, was a couple of two, and there was a 60-year-old and a 61-year-old. So if I hit submit and I scroll down here, I see that, and let me say this first, when it comes to any premium subsidy you may receive, it's based on the cost of the second lowest priced silver policy available to you on your state exchange. And for this particular couple in Denver, that was going to be $14,482 a year. And they didn't like the sound of that one bit because Today, they were paying about, I think it was $600 a month or $7,200 a year. So their premium was going to double. And I indicated to these individuals, well, let me tell you about how an HSA works. If you have a policy that's qualified to work with a health savings account, you can open and fund an account. If you're an individual, you can put in up to $3,250. You don't have to, but you have the option to. Since you're a couple, you could put in up to $6,450, and actually, since this couple's over the age of 55, they could put in an additional $1,000 each. It's called the catch-up provision, so they could have put in up to $8,450 into their account. But just for illustration purposes here, I want to assume they go with the HSA qualified plan that we talked about, and next year they're going to put in $4,000. So that's going to lower their taxable income from $66,000 to $62,000. And what I want everybody to note here is suddenly they're right at 400% of the federal poverty level. They're actually $20 below 400% of the federal poverty level. And at that point, their income, the percentage of their income that they have to spend on their insurance premium, it's capped at 9.5%. So that means the most they would spend is $5,890. That second cheapest bronze plan, excuse me, second cheapest silver plan was $14,482. So they have a premium credit, premium subsidy, whichever term you prefer, of $8,592. Now they could use that to purchase the second cheapest silver plan and they would pay $5,890 per year or they could purchase any other policy they wanted on the exchange 
and the federal government still going to pay that $8,592 of, of their premium. So uh, that starts to show the value of an HSA contribution. I'm going to give about three or four more examples because I'm going to show some much more startling facts over the course of the next couple of minutes. <clears throat> Just to use a totally different state, because rates do vary from state to state, let's change to the great state of Georgia where I presently live. I live in Athens. That's my zip code there. And what we see is the cost of coverage, oops, I didn't hit submit, sorry. The cost of coverage in Georgia is just a little bit less in, than it is in Colorado, so their subsidy didn't change much at all. But let's do this. Let's say that this couple, instead of making $62,000 in taxable income, at the, that the last day of the year, their boss gave them a $41 Christmas bonus. I know $41 is an odd amount, uh, but that puts them just over 400% of the federal poverty level. Suddenly, they're paying their entire premium. They lost over $8,000 in subsidy. So that's kind of showing people that I would consider to be at an upper middle class income. I want to look at the other end of the spectrum for a moment, and I'm going to drop this couple's uh, taxable income. I'm going to cut it just about in half to $31,200. We're going to leave them in Georgia. And the reason I use this amount is I want to show just a couple things. Oh, I needed to show you one other thing before I change screens. Sorry about that. One other item that we see, we know with any silver policy or with any bronze policy or any gold policy for that matter, if you make more than 250% of the federal poverty level, your family, the most you would pay for medical bills before your insurance paid 100% is displayed right here. It's $12,700. Once you've spent that, you're 100% covered the rest of the year. But if you get below 250% of the federal poverty level, then you start getting some help with paying for your medical bills too. And that's why I chose this number of 3120. That puts the individual at 200% of the federal poverty level. And we see that their out-of-pocket maximum drops to 10,400. So they're saving $2,300 a year in medical bills. They're also suddenly getting over a $12,000 premium subsidy. So compared to the couple that was making $62,000 and they were getting about $8,000 in premium subsidy, they're paying $4,000 less for their health insurance and $2,300 less for their medical bills. And some people may think if you make $30,000 a year more, it's fair for you to pay $6,300 more for your insurance and your medical bills. But let's change this by $1 more, and we'll all see if, if the person that we are looking at now making $31,020, if they think that the person making $1 less is being treated comparably to them. We see their premium credit's going to stay the same, 12084 but they've dropped right $1 below 200% of the federal poverty level. So suddenly their out-of-pocket maximum, their worst most they'd spend on medical bills, plummets all the way from 10200 to 4500 So in this particular case, $1 of additional income or $1 less income, saves this family $5,700 in their medical bills. And just comparing those last two examples, this couple's the same age. They live in the same zip code. They have the exact same health insurance policy, and they make $1 difference from each other. Well, if I was in 
had to choose which one of those couples to be, I think I'd have to choose to be the couple that made a dollar less because I would certainly rather my medical bills be capped out at $4,500 a year as opposed to more than $10,000 a year. And I personally, as somebody that's considered myself an entrepreneur most of my life, I, I find it astounding that making $1 less or 5 or $10 less can actually save people over $5,000 a year. Now, let me note this. I'm going to add that $1 back to their income. So they're right at 200% of the federal poverty level. They're out of pocket spending limits back to 10,400. What if this family purchased an HSA qualified policy? Oh, one other point I should make, these cost sharing credits or subsidies that I've been referring to, they only apply if you purchase a silver policy. You can get any silver level policy you want. It can be HSA or not. It can be the second cheapest or the most expensive or anywhere in between. But if you make less than 250% of the federal poverty level and you qualify for the cost sharing credits, you're only gonna get it if you purchase a silver plan so please don't consider a bronze level plan just because it may be cheaper, because I would hate to see you spending $12,700 on medical bills next year instead of $4,500 just to save a few bucks a month on your insurance premium. But for this couple making $31,020, let's say they get an HSA qualified plan and they think that they don't really have the money to contribute to the account, but they know that it's a good idea because it gives them options that they wouldn't have otherwise. So sometime next year, they open their account, they put in just a minimum opening deposit of $10. It's gonna lower their taxable income by 10 bucks. Doesn't do much for, to change their insurance premium. In fact, it didn't change at all but putting that $10 in their HSA, lowering their taxable income by even $1, cuts their potential out-of-pocket medical bills by $5,700. And that's one reason that I say, as I have been telling people for 10 years, that for the vast majority of people that I talk to, an HSA is the best way to go. And there was a lot of talk when the reform law was passed that HSAs would be done away with and that they wouldn't be considered compliant, qualified policies. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they are. They're on the marketplace. You can purchase them as soon as you can get all the way through the three-step complicated process that it takes to apply for health insurance today. And I highly encourage everyone regardless of your income level, to at least consider looking at an HSA qualified plan because it will give you an option that you would not have otherwise. So let me get back to my slides here. I think this is the last one or maybe next to last and then I'm gonna start taking questions momentarily. And that is, I wanna speak for just for a couple minutes about the benefit of using a licensed certified insurance professional here at HSA for America, we call ourselves advisors, as opposed to an exchange navigator. You know, a licensed certified agent, there's nobody else in this country that is going to be able to provide you with the level of wisdom that I've just shared with you this evening, and I don't mean that about myself personally. I mean, if you're not talking to a licensed certified insurance advisor, you're not getting this level of advice showing you what a difference $1 can make or why you should take an HSA, even if it maybe cost a few dollars a month more in premium. So better yet, working with an agent costs you nothing. It's absolutely free, and I don't mean that attending this webinar tonight was free. What I mean is once you've selected the health insurance policy that you're going to purchase, whether you get it on the exchange, whether you call and talk to one of their navigators that they just hired a couple months ago that 
doesn't really yet understand how insurance works, there's or if you purchase it from HSA for America, the price that you pay will be exactly the same because we don't charge for our services. Just like other insurance professionals, we receive a commission from an insurance company, and believe it or not, it's actually cheaper for the insurance company to pay an agent a commission than it is to hire and train and manage their own internal sales force. So no matter where you purchase, the price is the price. So I suggest to everybody, if you're getting your next policy from HSA for America or from somebody else, please do yourself the service of making sure that you seek the advice of a licensed and certified insurance professional. And the reason I keep stressing the word certified is if you're not certified with the exchange that you're selling on, you're not allowed to sell there. So somebody could be an insurance agent and not certified to sell in a particular state, and they couldn't help you enroll on the exchange. They could sell you a policy off the exchange, but if you buy off the exchange, you don't get any premium assistance or any cost-sharing subsidies. And I'm not going to say anything bad about the navigators, but I will say that the navigators are very inexperienced. They were created to man customer service centers to take a large volume of phone calls that's happening right now. Uh, but they're not legally allowed to explain to you how a policy will work. They cannot tell you how the different benefits of a policy works, let alone which policy is going to work best for your personal situation. All they're allowed to do is read from a script that they were given. And I've actually called and spoken to some of these navigators over the last couple of weeks just so I had a firsthand experience of what people were actually hearing if they called the exchange instead of working with an agent. And I've spoken with some clients that have done the same thing. And each and every one of us had the exact same opinion, and that is the people that we were talking to, they were not very well trained. They didn't really sound like they understood what they were talking about, but they could do a real good job at reading a script that was put in front of them. But if you ask them a question that caused them to go off script, you usually get put on hold while they go ask somebody what they're allowed to say, and then they come back and give you a one-line answer and go right back to reading their script. So those navigators, they're not even going to be here year-round. If you're working with an insurance professional like HSA for America, we will be here not only to help you find the best plan on or off the exchange today, or maybe it's to purchase a 2013 plan so you avoid these big premium increases for all of next year, but we'll also be here to help you if you have any problems throughout the year. If customer service at the insurance company isn't treating you right, give us a call. Let us take care of that headache for you. We have contacts at the insurance company that you wouldn't possibly have. If you have problems getting a claim filed, or if you find yourself in a situation where you're thinking, wow, my deductible or my out-of-pocket exposure here is a whole lot higher than I realized. I thought I was getting better coverage, and suddenly I'm having to pay more money out of my pocket. Well, we can help show you other products that can help fill in the gaps so maybe you don't have to pay much of that deductible at all if you add some additional coverage along the way. And once again, as I have said time and time again, an HSA is still the way, at least for the vast majority of people that I talk to. And I talk to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people every year, if not every month. So to real quickly recap before I open up the line for questions, there's going to be huge rate increases to buy health insurance for a lot of people in this country. Even those of you that are getting premium credits, so your premium appears to be going down, the cost of that insurance policy is really going up in 48 out of 50 states in this country. You're just getting somebody the assistance of somebody else to potentially pay for some of that bill for you. But on the bright side, everybody's guaranteed to be able to get coverage. That is, without question, my favorite 
thing about health care reform. Now, again, kind of on the other side of the equation, everybody's taxes are going to be going up. Not only are there new taxes on items that this law put in place to help pay for some of the cost of this legislation, but the sheer fact that the government's going to be paying millions, if not billions of dollars to insurance companies to cover the cost of these premium subsidies and the cost-sharing subsidies, that is sooner or later going to mean higher taxes for each and every one of us, even those of us that may get the premium subsidy. Um, on the bright side, a lot of people are going to have access to more benefits than ever before, and the best one of those, in my opinion, is maternity. If you've purchased individual coverage in the past, in a lot of states, you could not add maternity coverage. In states where it was available as an option, it usually cost too much or had a longer waiting period that made it not a good value. Well, now each and every health plan in this country is going to have maternity. So if you're of childbearing age and you're wanting to bring a family into this world and have your insurance company help you pay the bill, welcome to 2014. That coverage is going to be available for all. And once again, I hate playing the devil's advocate and talking the good and the bad, but I'm here to explain to everybody both sides of this legislation tonight. And the downside of every policy having maternity is those of you that maybe aren't married, maybe you're no longer of childbearing age, or maybe you're like me and you've had a vasectomy and there better not be any more children born in your house. Well, guess what? You're going to be paying for maternity coverage anyway because it is now a part of all health policies in America. This next comment, fewer doctors to choose from, that's something I have not yet touched on, and I could go on for an hour, but I'm going to be really quick. The reason I say that is over half the policies being sold on the exchange in this country are HMOs. And on average, an HMO has 35% the amount of doctors and hospitals that a PPO has. And if you go and see a doctor that's not in the HMO, you have no coverage at all unless you are in a true medical emergency. Now, some companies are, that are selling HMOs on the exchange, they're selling PPOs off the exchange at a higher rate. And the reason for that is if a doctor is a part of a PPO program, he's not offering that insurance company as big of a discount as a doctor that participates in an HMO. So ultimately, if you are using a PPO, your bills are higher because your insurance company couldn't negotiate the doctor down as low in his price as they could with an HMO. And my primary point here and then I'm going to start taking questions in just a moment, is be very, very careful of which policy you apply for, especially if the freedom of choice of your doctor or using the hospital that you want is important to you. And even if your doctor's in, in the HMO that you're looking at, well, the Mayo Clinic or John Hopkins Hospital, they're more than likely not. And hopefully not myself or anybody listening to the sound of my voice this evening will ever need to be in the Mayo Clinic or in John Hopkins. But what if you had some dreaded disease and you wanted the absolute finest care available and you knew it was available at one of those two facilities? Well, if you had an HMO, you know, your dreaded disease may in fact be a medical emergency. Certainly it is from your perspective. But unless you're closer to John Hopkins than you are to your local HMO, or, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I kind of got tongue-tied there for a second. Unless you're closer to John Hopkins than you are to your HMO, unless you're at risk of dying, if you go to John Hopkins and they're not in the HMO, you have no coverage at all. Even if you are in a life-threatening emergency, and John Hopkins is the closest hospital, so you go there, as soon as your situation stabilizes, if you have an HMO, you're expected to get back to an HMO hospital. And most people, when they're laying there in recovery at the finest hospital in the country, they don't want to think about having to be transported back across the country to, to go to their HMO hospital 
And if you don't, then you're going to wind up paying all the rest of the bill yourself once your situation has stabilized. So I'm sure in that last point there, I probably came across as somebody that's a little bit anti-HMO, which I can be at times. And that's because I personally, for me, believe in freedom of choice. I also travel a lot, so an HMO doesn't really work for me. Some people that I know love their HMO, and others get it because they see it as the cheapest option, and then they want out of it as soon as possible once they realize how their coverage works. And since we can no longer change health insurance anytime we want, we can only do it during an open enrollment period, which next year is only 45 days long, not six months then I would say it's more important than ever before that during this first open enrollment period that you make the best possible decision for the policy that's going to work best for you for at least the next year. So I caution you, please don't just go out and shop based on price. Instead, make sure that you get the coverage. It's going to be very best suited for your particular situation. And whether that's an HMO or a PPO, please at least take a look at getting an HSA qualified plan. Even if you think you wouldn't have money to contribute to the account, or if you think that you're at an income level where contributing $3,200 as an individual or $6,450 as a family might not make any difference for you when it comes to premium or or cost-sharing subsidies next year, we don't ever know what the future is going to hold in store for us. But we do know one thing, and that is if you have an HMA, an HSA, it gives you an option that no other health insurance possibly can because you can contribute to your HSA account as late as April 15th of the following year. So if we're talking about determining your subsidy for 2014, if you have an HSA qualified plan, you could fund it as late as April 15th of 2015 and count that contribution towards next year. So you could literally be sitting there with your accountant, have opened your HSA and maybe put in $10, and see, oh my goodness, if my taxable income was just $1 lower, I would get a subsidy to help me pay for my insurance, or I would not lose my subsidy, or I would get a cost-sharing subsidy, and my out-of-pocket would drop from $10,400 to $4,500, then I would advise you to go put those few dollars in the HSA account that it takes to save you thousands and thousands of dollars. And without an HSA-qualified plan, that is just simply not possible. So an HSA may not be right for you, whether it is or it isn't, please at least consider it because it does give you that valuable option that you would not have otherwise. Oops. And if everybody will give me one second, let me get the chat box open and see if we have any questions here. It does look like we've had a few coming in. First, to Steve, how do you tell if a policy is HSA qualified? Steve has multiple questions. I'm going to address it one at a time. Two different ways, Steve. When you run quotes on the website, you would see in the name of the policy. It would either have the words HSA in the name, or it would have the letters HDHP, which stands for High Deductible Health Plan. And policies that have those two things in the name tend to be HSA qualified. There are several different criteria that make a policy HSA qualified. The deductible has to be at least a certain amount. Uh, but let, let's say you have a policy that is a $5,000 deductible, and you know that an HSA policy could have a $5,000 deductible. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that every $5,000 deductible policy is HSA qualified because there's several other things that go into making it up as well. Primarily, the policy cannot cover anything other than preventative care visits, which all health insurance policies now cover all recommended preventative care services anyway. So an HSA can't pay for anything else until you've met your deductible. 
So what that means is if you're looking at a policy and it says you have a $35 copayment when you go to the doctor before you've met your deductible, that's not HSA qualified. So ultimately, it's the insurance company that in their policy says this policy is HSA qualified. It meets all the requirements of the Internal Revenue Code, Section 223C. But you don't need to read the policy to figure that out for yourself. Uh, any quotes online would indicate it. Or, of course, if you're seeking the assistance of one of the advisors at HSA for America, we will make sure that you know which policies are HSA qualified and which are not. Now, Steve had some other questions. Let me just scroll back up. Where do you find a provider list for the policy? That's a great question. And also, how can you tell if it's portable? But again, I'll address them one at a time after a sip of water. <laughs> how do you find a provider list? That could vary depending on what state you're in or which exchange it is that you're applying on. Ideally, if all the exchanges were working correctly, which few of them are, you should be able to go into the exchange, pull up quotes, and you should see a little button that says find a doctor, or some of them even ask you along the way, is there a certain doctor you want to make sure that, that you can work with? And if the computer programs were working properly and you entered a doctor, it would only show you policies that your doctor accepted. So if it was an HMO or a PPO, or there's a couple other types of policies that are similar to HMOs and PPOs, uh, it, it should only show you the policies that that doctor is in. However, at this moment, that Find a Doctor tool is not working properly. For a couple days, I saw it in a few states functioning right, and then it mysteriously stopped. All these different exchanges are saying that that is coming. That's something that will work eventually, but that's not their highest priority. Right now, they want to just be able to show pr premium prices and then hopefully get it to where you can apply online. So the fallback position then would be once you have selected the insurance company or the particular plan that would work best for you, uh, go to that insurance company's website, or if you're running quotes on HSA for America, if you were looking at 2014 quotes, which unfortunately I will say they're not there yet. Our computer programmers got given all the rates October 1 at midnight, and they're still working on programming as fast as they can. <laughs> but if you were to say, look at a policy from Blue Cross, you'd see a little link there that says find a doctor and you could click on it and it would open the Blue Cross provider directory and you would be able to type your doctor's name and see if he accepted that policy or not. Or of course, if you're talking with one of our advisors, you can ask and we'll do that search for you. We certainly are much more familiar with hopping around the internet and finding those provider directories much more quickly than somebody that doesn't do this all day, every day. <laughs> so ultimately, maybe sometime next year, the exchanges will work beautifully and you could just do it all right there. But for right now, you'd need to check it plan by plan by plan or talk to somebody that would be willing and able to do that for you. Steve's next question, how do you tell if a plan is portable? Very few plans are portable at this particular time, and to anybody that's not familiar with that term, that basically means if I move, can I take my policy with me and keep it, you know, whether I move to another part of my state or if I move to another state. If you get an HMO, odds are real good it's not going to be portable because most HMOs are very regional. Even something like Kaiser, which is one of the bigger HMOs in this country. Um, in Kaiser, if you had Kaiser, it's available if you live in some parts of Colorado, for example, but not in other parts. So if you moved out of Denver and went to Pueblo or some real rural part of Colorado, you could lose your Kaiser even though you stayed in the same state. 
Uh, the law, the reform law, it did have a provision that allowed the creation of multi-state policies that somebody would be able to purchase and keep the same policy even, no matter where they went and moved. Uh, I'm only seeing a handful of those available right now. There's been such a mad dash in this industry for everybody to get ready for October 1. And whether it was the federal government running slow or the state being slow building an exchange, or in a lot of instances, insurance companies have rates filed with the Department of Insurance in that state. And the Department of Insurance has to approve that rate before the insurance company can start selling it. And there's companies out there that are still waiting for approval that would like to be selling policies today. So I do expect that we will see more and more of these multi-state plans become available. It's not a reality today. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the only ones that I've been seeing so far are available from Blue Cross Blue Shield. I have also seen some news reports or agent uh, information from Humana that indicated they were creating multi-state plans too, but they're not in place yet. And the last part of my answer to Steve's portability question is if you have a particular insurance company and you move from one state to another and they offer the same policy in your new state, you're allowed to keep it then. The only thing that would happen would be your premium would change and it could go up or it could go down depending on if you move somewhere where insurance costs more or somewhere where insurance costs less. So in that particular situation, your policy would be portable, but your premium would be variable. Okay, let's see. Okay, I, interestingly enough, my next set of questions is also from Steve. And just as a little side personal note, even though I call myself Fred, my first name's actually Steven. Fred's my middle name, so it looks like we got a group of Steves here tonight. So good to talk to you guys. Uh, so Steve M. wants to know if he decides to drop his insurance because he can't afford it, what are the penalties? Great question. In all the webinars I've done up until now, I've been talking about the penalties. Uh, I was trying to make this one a little shorter than some of the others have gone, so I had more times for questions. If you choose not to purchase health insurance next year, or if you don't have coverage for three months or longer next year, then you will pay a tax penalty. The tax penalty is $95 per person in the household or 1% of the total household income, whichever number is greater. And if you do some quick math, that tells me not too many people will pay $95 because that would be 1% of 9500 And if you're making less than $11,000, you should be eligible for Medicaid, at least in most states. The federal law says you should be in every state, but not all states are expanding Medicaid. So most people that don't have coverage for at least three months next year, they will be paying 1% of their total household income. Now, just to take that one step further, let's say you had coverage for six months next year and you had to drop it for whatever reason then your tax penalty would be prorated based on the number of months. So if you made 50,000, 1% 1 of that's 500, but you had coverage for half the year, your tax penalty would be $250. And St. Steve, another question. It might be less to pay the penalty than to pay the rate increase. Yes, sir, I've had that conversation with quite a few people and two things that I usually say, you know, one, if you're going to do that, you might want to consider purchasing some sort of protection 
that's not a policy that's considered to be reform compliant. So it's not a bronze, silver, gold, platinum. There's actually something called a catastrophic plan that I didn't address today. It's typically only available to people that are under the age of 30, and it costs about as much as a bronze policy, and you don't get any tax credits. So I'm going to have a hard time picturing anybody buying a catastrophic policy on or off the exchange. But if you were to purchase what I consider to be true catastrophic coverage, which some insurance companies do make available still, say something like that have a twenty, thirty, or fifty thousand dollar deductible, just so you're protected in case of a worst case scenario, you're going to see a lot smaller insurance premium than you would buying on the exchange, and you're probably going to come out ahead even after paying the tax penalty unless, heaven forbid, you had a $50,000 deductible and you wound up incurring that much in medical bills, then you're probably not going to come out ahead. But I would certainly suggest that having some sort of protection just to protect yourself from a worst-case unexpected scenario is a good idea. And to some people, they may think, goodness gracious, I'm not going to get a $50,000 deductible because if I did and I had to pay that, I'd go bankrupt anyway. So why I pay an insurance premium, I'll just risk it and, <laughs> and I'll go bankrupt on the entire bill. So another alternative that you could consider is purchasing a short-term health insurance policy, which depending on the state you live in, you can keep for six or 12 months. The thing about any non-reform compliant plans whether it's that $50,000 true catastrophic policy or a short-term policy, since they're not uh, forced to comply with the law, they are allowed to ask health questions. So if you're somebody that's maybe had a heart attack or cancer or diabetes, you're going to be asked the same health questions to apply for a short-term plan that you would applying for a permanent plan and you would get turned down. But if you're somebody like Steve that's thinking, maybe I just don't want this overpriced new Obamacare because it'd be cheaper to pay the penalty and, and I think I'll probably stay healthy, well, you could consider a short-term policy. And in a lot of instances, you would find it may be cheaper than that twenty to $50,000 catastrophic plan. It would have a lot lower deductible also and if anybody's sitting there thinking, that doesn't make any sense, Fred, why would a $1,000 deductible short-term cost less than a $50,000 deductible permanent plan? And the reason for that is once that short-term ends, whether it's six months or 12 months, your policy's over. So if you had developed cancer or had a heart attack and you had a short-term plan, six months later your coverage ends, then you're on the hook for the rest of the medical bills because they're not going to enroll you for coverage. Now, due to reform, what you could do in that situation is wait till next October 15th, enroll for a policy that would be effective January 1, 2015. So you would eventually be able to get more coverage that would help you with that pre-existing condition, even any ongoing treatment that you may be receiving. But if you were to take that approach, unless you're in a state that allows you to purchase a 12-month short-term policy, you potentially could have a, a up to six months during a year where you had no health insurance and, you know, heaven forbid, if you were undergoing a few hundred thousand dollars of cancer treatment, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to be in that situation the last six months of the year waiting on the next open enrollment period. That said, I know a lot of people that are going to roll the dice and take a lot cheaper short-term policy for next year and kind of wait and see what happens with reform and, and what rates look like during open enrollment next year. And in just about every example that I could run, if you're just looking at what you pay in your monthly premium and what you pay for that tax penalty, unless you have a super, super high income, you wind up paying less next year, taking the short term plus the tax penalty, as opposed to getting the, uh, the new reform compliant plan. 
unless you're somebody that's at an income level that you're getting a big enough tax credit to, to pay for that big, huge new premium. And, and that really comes down to everybody's situation is different. You know, the cost varies depending on age, state, and income. So to actually do that math and figure out what would in, help you next year spend the least money on taxes, insurance, medical bills, uh, that would require a one-on-one -on -one appointment or consultation, whether it's with one of the advisors at HSA for America or somebody else. We're certainly happy to do it for you for free if you'd like our assistance, and I promise you we'll give you the best advice possible. Okay, I think Steve had one more question. Okay, now that addressed Steve. Okay, we have a non-Steve asking question. Paul, welcome to our conversation. Paul wants to know what was the bronze plan where you will not be able to qualify for a subsidy that only a silver plan could? If I did not make that clear enough, thank you for that question. The assistance for paying your insurance premium, that's available to anybody that makes between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level. And that number varies depending on how many people are in your household. But you can also, if you make between 100% and 250% of the federal poverty level, then you can get a second type of subsidy. In addition to the government paying for part of your insurance premium, they're going to pay for some of your medical bills also. And they, that uh, subsidy only applies if you get a silver plan. So if you make less than 250% of the federal poverty level, which for an individual, actually I was going to say, I was going to give an educated guess, but I'll look it up on this screen because I have my chart here. For an individual, that would be about $28,000 a year. If you make less than that, then what you would have to pay for your medical bills would be less if you purchased a silver plan. But if you got the bronze, even at that income level, you wouldn't get the premium, the uh, cost-sharing subsidy. And one more question from Paul, and it's the last one in the chat, and I'm going to unmute the phone. If you have an HSA plan, would that not make it portable anyway? Uh, portability can really be looked at a couple different ways, Steve. Once you've placed money into a health savings account, that money's yours until you spend it. So the money in the HSA account, yeah, that's portable. If you were to move from Georgia to Colorado, even if you had to change your health insurance policy, the money in your health savings account remains yours. Now, once you move to Colorado, if you had to change health insurance policies, which that would vary depending on what company you had in Georgia and whether or not they were available in Colorado. If you wanted to continue contributing to an HSA, then you would have to get an HSA qualified plan in Colorado as well. If you did not, you wouldn't lose any of the money that you had put in your HSA, but you couldn't keep putting in any more money. And if you made that move during the middle of the year, if you don't keep your HSA policy for a full calendar year, then your contribution is prorated. So if you moved in the middle of the year and you only had an HSA the first six months of the year, instead of being able to put in 3250 if you were an individual, it would be half that, which would be $1,625. And that leads me to one more tip I want to say about an HSA that I, I did not have planned for this evening. The way that the HSA law reads, it says if you have, if you have a qualified high deductible health plan effective by December 1, you are allowed to make the full year's contribution. So for the last 10 years, during the month of October, all, in November and all the way up to December 1st, we've been encouraging people that didn't have an HSA 
to get one, fund their account, and save thousands of dollars on their tax return next year. Now, there's a little caveat there, because if you're picking up your plan, I remember I said earlier, you have to keep it the full calendar year or your contribution is prorated. So if you got one starting December 1st of this year, you could put in $3,250 for 2013. If you're a family, you could put in $6,450. But you would have to keep an HSA qualified plan through all of next year, which that's 13 months, but the law says you have to keep it a full calendar year, calendar being the key word there. And if you didn't, then your contribution for this year should have been prorated to just one-twelfth of the allowable amount. And if you had put in more than that, then you'd be forced to take it back out and pay income taxes on that money, as well as a 20% penalty for over-contributing to the account. So, yeah, if there's anybody on – and one more thing. <laughs> this – will be the last year for most people that you can get an HSA qualified plan starting as late as December 1 and still fund an account for this year. And the reason I say that is next year you can't just buy health insurance anytime you want. If you have a life-changing event, like if you move, you can change plans at any time of year. If you get married, if your income changes significantly, if you have a child or adopt, you know, those are life-changing events. That gives you a 60-day special enrollment period at which time you could apply for coverage for a new plan. So if you had one of those next year, you could potentially switch to an HSA in the middle of the year. But if you were to sign up for an HSA during next year's open enrollment period, October 15th through December 7th, that's not going to start until January 1 of the following year, so that wouldn't really give you that last-minute ability to open up the HSA account and fully fund it for next year. But for anybody that's looking to lower their 2013 taxes, get yourself a qualified high-deductible health plan effective by December 1, keep it or any other HSA qualified plan for all of next year, you can make a full contribution for this year. You can make a full contribution for next year, too. And I know some clients that don't have an HSA, they want to buy on the exchange. But they also want to lower their taxable income this year, so they pay less tax this year. They're buying one HSA policy today, asking that it start December 1, and then they're turning around and buying another HSA-qualified plan on the exchange, That'll start January 1. They're going to keep the one in December one month, cancel it. They'll keep that other HSA qualified plan for all of next year. So they had an HSA starting the 1st of December of this year. They kept an HSA qualified plan for all of next year, and they can take the full tax deduction for any money they contribute up to the legal allowable limit for both years. I don't know a whole lot of people that are doing that, but we've definitely had a few dozen clients that uh, just over the course of the last few weeks that have loved that idea and are definitely taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, oh, I got another question from Steve. Am I aware of any HSA non-compliant policies? No, sir. There are some HSA policies that you can buy off the exchange, but if you're talking exchange period, you know, on the exchange means uh, you have the opportunity to get a subsidy or a tax credit. If you buy off the exchange, you're not eligible for any tax credits. Those policies off the exchange have to cover the same 10 essential health benefits that on the exchange does. Uh, there are a few minor benefits that, aren't, that are covered on the exchange that are not considered to be the 10 essential health benefits that all policies have to contain. 
So the theory that I had heard for three years was insurance companies would have policies off the exchange that didn't cover a couple minimal non-essential health benefits, and that would allow them to keep premiums down a little bit. And in reality, just the opposite is happening. What so many insurance companies are doing is they're selling HMOs on the exchange so they can show a product as cheap as possible to attract people that are going to be purchasing the cheapest plan because they're getting tax credits or subsidies. And then they're turning around and selling the same exact product, but that's a PPO instead of an HMO off the exchange. And in that scenario, the price off the exchange is like 30% more. Uh, some other companies that are selling identical products and networks on and off the exchange, oddly enough, they seem to be coming in costing about 3% more off the exchange. And, and I can't figure out the logic in that yet. I've tried, but uh, some things in this life just defy logic, and a whole lot of things about health care reform <laughs> have been logic-defying, and, and that's been one of the more recent ones that I've come across. And we couldn't see off-exchange rates until two weeks ago, so nobody really knew what it was going to look like, and them being higher was a surprise other than the companies that offered the PPO versus the HMO on the exchange. Okay, that's the end of the chat. Let's unmute the line and see if anybody wants to talk. Okay, well, good evening. Whoever's left with me, if you do have any questions, I just ask a couple things. State your first name so I know who I'm talking to, please. Also, like to know where you're calling from because that could slightly affect the answer to your question. And let me know what questions you got. Good luck stumping me. <laughs> Anybody? I will say this. Sometimes when I unmute the phone lines, some people will be thinking questions in their head that maybe um, are related to a specific health issue that they have. And if that's the case, you know, an, an open phone line may not be the most comfortable place to ask that kind of question. Um, if that's your situation, please feel free. You can give us a call right after uh, this webinar ends if you would like. Our number should be here on the screen, but I got to the wrong slide. <laughs> Our toll-free number is 866-749-2039. And again, there is really never any cost for our services. We are here to act as an advocate on your behalf. We want to help you get the best coverage at the lowest possible price so you keep as much of your hard-earned money as possible, whether it's in your bank account or in your health savings account. I'd rather help you keep your money than you pay more than you should to an insurance company or, heaven forbid, more than you should to the doctor or the hospital. So we're going to help you find the exact ground that works best for you so that you have the level of protection that you're most comfortable with so that you do keep ultimately as much of your hard-earned money as possible. And hopefully none of us need our health insurance next year. We have a wonderful, happy, healthy life. But odds are, with, with a couple dozen people on the phone call, some of us are going to incur tens of thousands of medical bills, and we're here to help protect you from that. All for free. So any questions, I'll give you one more chance. Well, if not, it has been my pleasure. I hope everyone walks away having learned several things. Uh, and again, if you need our help, please give us a call. It's 866-749-2039. We do have operators manning the phones till at least midnight. Uh, sometimes it's tough to get transferred to an advisor right after the webinar because they're all on the phone. Uh, if you need to seek assistance via email and you're not already in contact with one of our advisors, 
the email that you see here on my screen. That goes directly to my assistant. It's saleshelp at hsaforamerica.com. So uh, if you want your questions answered via email, you can send them to Amanda, and she'll either get them to your assigned advisor, or if you want to hear from me personally, I'll make the time to answer your question directly. I can't promise it'll be instantly, because the last couple weeks have been crazy. I've worked 18 hours a day most days, and I'm still running behind, but I'm here to help as many people as I can, save as much money as possible, and figure out this crazy new way that health insurance works. And, and I hope I've done a little bit of that for each and every one of you this evening. And if you ever need our help, let us know. We're here, 866-749-2039. Y'all have a delightful rest of your day.